Okay, so today, well, welcome to the lecture, everyone. Um, today is the last lecture of the class, um, and we're gonna take this as a moment to talk about, like, about hardware design on the whole, and why we care about it, why we think it is important, and why we bothered running an IAP class teaching you all how to do it. Um, I wanna take a step back here and think about, like, the actual impacts of what this, uh, what this means, and also, like, directions that you can take this in the future, because, um, at, like, in a week's time, we won't get to see you anymore, and so you're gonna be off in the real world making hardware, and we wanna make sure you're well prepared to do so. Um, cool. Well, but first, we have some announcements. Um, we have uh, lab sections and like layout DRs tomorrow and Thursday. Um, it's probably gonna run the same where like we try and get all of the layout DRs done on Tuesday, just like we did for lab two, um, but we're probably not gonna get through everyone, so if we don't get to you, uh, come to Thursdays. Um, we're just gonna be running around lab, and um, feel free to come to lab sec to more than just the lab section that you signed up for. Um, basically, it's gonna, like lab this week is gonna be some combination of like lab and also just office hours, trying to get all y'all's speakers done and put together. Um, so yeah, just come to uh, as much of that as you would like to, and we will get your speakers together. Um, yeah, we have like maybe a third of them like put together, and stuff appears to be working. So uh, we also have a lot of spare parts for stuff. So like theoretically, everybody should be able to leave with a working one. Um, it's just gonna be a question of like how much effort and time uh, you have to put into it. Cool. Um, just be sure to come to the lab section that you were signed up for in addition to any other ones that you want to come to um, just so that we can like know when to come find you for um, layout DRs. But cool. Um, I also, Wanted to mention that we are getting, like, since we're getting to the end of IAP, um, Addy and I had to do grading and like get everybody's like stuff worked out there. Um, I just got the list from Core 6, and then I'm waiting on the one from Edgerton and Course 2. Um, but basically what's gonna happen there is I'm gonna go through and like check the registration for the class. And if you are like in the class, according to our records, and you're in the class, according to the registrar, um, then you will receive credit. Um, it's IAP, so it can be a little bit weird about like um, about how many units this class is worth because you get the option to put in units. Um, we will not be able to grant anything other than six units. So you might get an email from me saying that like, hi, um, you're not actually in the class and um, like we haven't seen you and you should probably drop so that we don't like give you an F. Um, or you might get an email from me saying like, hi, you're in the class, everything's good, just change the number of units you're registered for. Um, this is our first time like running through like grade submission and stuff. So we're gonna try and get the jump on this early just so that we are in a good spot um, and we don't have any like last minute panic stuff on Friday night where it's like, ah, like you're not actually registered for the class and we try and like um, retcon class registration harder than um, Disney did in Star Wars episode eight. Sound good? Cool. Um, also if you're track two, we have write-ups that are due Friday at 5 p.m. Um, we cannot offer extensions on that. Again, registrar constraints. Um, please send those to us over email, just a PDF is good, or a markdown source if you have it, also works. Um, and then uh, we have a, um, we got a little shindig going on on Wednesday night. We're gonna have pizza and some music, and then just good vibes in lobby 13. Um, that'll start at seven, and then we'll probably like wrap up around nine. But yeah, we're just gonna blow whatever like remaining class budget we have on pizza. Um, come on, uh, stop by, bring your friends, it'll be a lovely time. Cool. Any questions thus far? All sound good? Kosher? Great. Um, okay, so we're moving on to like the actual content for today. We wanna to talk about why we should care about hardware in a world that's increasingly like becoming driven by software. Um, like, ChatGPT came out not that long ago. Um, people have been losing their minds over that and it might have also written like half of my Piazza replies. And that's like, I don't know, the, the world is gonna like be transitioning, is taking more and more advantage of artificial intelligence, software on the whole, um, and we want to justify why we still care about hardware. Um, and this is like not, this is a trend that we are um, able to see, like just looking at MIT's like registration and statistics. Um, like this is just within course six. Um, you can see how many EEs there are. This is current undergraduate enrollment. Um, there's 46, six ones, woo! Um, but there's 
10 times as many 6-2s, like 354, and then there's 20 times more 6-3s, 823. Um, the average class size here is around 1,200, so between just 6-2 and 6-3, we have literally like um, a quarter of MIT's undergrad population. Like, people seem to care a lot about this. Um, and it's interesting to like note that there's like this uh, emphasis on um, off of hardware. And truthfully, like we could have done the entirety of what we were trying to build. Like we could have made the Bluetooth speaker um, without a PCB. We could have taught. We could have gotten to the same end result without having to teach PCB design. Um, and this is actually how we prototyped it. You can go on Amazon and buy these modules for super super cheap. Um, where everybody has put like the UART bridge, the uh, power circuitry, and the microcontroller all onto a board for you. Um, and this is like what, $18 for three of them? So what is that, like $6 each? Um, that's actually pretty close to how much the USB port, the power regulator, the microcontroller, and the UART converter cost. Like this is very, this, the extra complexity here of them putting on a PCB and soldering it for us, um, that's basically free, at least in terms of like the costs that we paid for our chips. Um, okay, cool, so that's a microcontroller. What about the um, DAC? Oh, here I can also buy three of them for $17 as well. Um, that's a little more expensive than what uh, it would have cost just buy the part, but like I can get this tomorrow, um, and it's not that expensive. Um, Okay, what about the actual amplifier? Oh, here's two of them for $15, and it comes with a big heat sink, it's all laid out for me, and that's basically it. Um, cool, well, that's most of the circuit, but we, don't, um, but we don't have power. Oh wait, Amazon can take care of us too there. Um, and here, each one of these is $2, and it even has type C, instead of the micro B port. Um, and there's like battery protection, there's charging, all that is integrated there. Cool, um, we didn't need a PCB to make y'all's Bluetooth speaker. So, interesting. Um, when we were prototyping it all, we used these modules, and I was able to throw together the entire design in like two days. And then that, plus the firmware that we just got off of um, GitHub that was basically exactly what we needed um, with very little modification, that was the entire design. And we went from like nothing to something that would probably work when you turn it into a board in like two days. Um, that was done to de-risk the project as quickly as possible to make sure that it would work for y'all, but um, why do we bother teaching a PCB class when you can do that? Again, going back to the numbers here, um, if there's like this big, if hardware is like such a commodity to the point where I can buy it for very little cost, very little overhead on Amazon, um, have it delivered tomorrow and then build my stuff with that. Why do I care about making boards? Why do I care about doing hardware design? Um, and I think that a lot of, um, uh, a lot of undergrads um, kind of feel similarly, right? Like why would you wanna go be a 6-1 uh, and like, you know, think about like resistor dividers and capacitors and all that stuff when you can just buy it as a board, plug it in, use the manufacturer's recommendations and code you found on the internet and then you're done. It's a valid question, um, and let's say like, okay, well, maybe that's, maybe like all of these modules that we're buying off of Amazon and putting together, maybe that's more of like a 6.2 kind of approach. Maybe 6.2s care about that because it's like, there's some firmware that goes on that ESP, and then there's some like other circuitry, we got the DAC, we got the amplifier, all that lives, um, all of that lives on there, and so maybe we say like, okay, it's just the 6.2s that care about this. Maybe let's try appealing to the 823 6.3s, right? Um, also unrelated, I have no idea why like there's .5s in any of this. Um, I don't know what half of a like computer science and molecular biology major is. Um, if anyone knows the answer to that, please tell me afterwards. I'd love to know. Um, but anyway, if we assume it, like let's uh, let's try appealing to the 823 whole, not cut in half, six threes. Um, okay, let's look at computers. Right, um, this is ENIAC and it's from the 50s. This is like the OG computer. Does anyone know what it was made out of? Transistors didn't exist at the time and integrated circuits were, the guy who invented them was maybe in grade school? What was it made out of? How did it work? Yeah. Okay, vacuum tubes and what else? 
Yes, vacuum tubes and relays. Um, and you can see that it occupied an entire room, right? Like, if you uh, look up here, there's a bunch of transformers, a bunch of magnetics, a bunch of other stuff on it. Um, and, okay, that's 1950s-ish. Let's fast forward 30 years into the future. Does anyone know what this machine is? This is a little more esoteric. No? Perfect. Um, this is a PDP-11, and it's what Unix was invented on. Um, Unix became Linux and also um, OpenBSD, or sorry, BSD, which eventually turned into Mac OS. Um, and this like, machine was what a lot of the like, software, um, or sorry, well, what the operating systems that run our day-to-day -day live on. Okay, so like, this is very clearly like, treasured in the hearts of the 6.3s, right? Um, cool, like people, uh, maybe we don't care, maybe, Six threes don't care so much about like the hardware for hardware's sake, but nearly just wanting something fast um, and that's quick that they can run their um, that they can run their uh, algorithms and their software on. Okay, let's let's take that line of thought and let's go forward another 30 years. This is a Google data center as of like 2010-ish or so, um, and then like after all of that technological progress that we've made over now 60 years, we started in the 50s with ENIAC vacuum tubes relays. We then moved into the 80s with the PDP-11, and then we kept going another 30 years, and now we're here. Well, over there, we started with a computer that occupies the size of a room, and then we went to a computer that occupies the size of a cabinet, and now we're here just buildings, just entire buildings, just computers, right? Um, so maybe, they, maybe we should care about um, hardware just because we don't have buildings full of hardware, right? Um, that's actually not the case. These, over that same like 60 year interval, we dropped the notion of like running programs on punch cards. We eventually go, went to like running programs on machines with tape. Um, and then we eventually moved on to not really caring about the machine that we were running on with cloud computing, right? Like but, um, in the 50s, you'd have to have all your data in the machine with you. Now we, that we have cloud computing, um, it doesn't really matter. Like, your machine can be disconnected from you, and um, where your code runs doesn't actually matter that much to you. So, okay, interesting. At least, we've taken this one step further in recent times with things, uh, with this particular concept called serverless compute, which basically means that, like, not only do we not care where the computer is that's munching on our data, we also don't even care like what the computer is. We don't care like um, who made it, where it lives, what kind of processor it has, um, or even like what operating system it runs. Um, all we care about is that it performs some function that we want. Um, AWS Lambda is one of the more popular solutions for this. Um, basically, it's Amazon's product that just like you give it a function, and it all that it does is pr does that function for you. Let's say that in this case, um, I stole this off of like some of their marketing materials, but the application that they're going for here is like, let's say that you're making um, an app like Google Photos, or um, I assume it's Apple Photos, iCloud Photos, I forget what the exact name is, but let's assume you're making something that like you take a picture, it stores it in the cloud, and you can like go download it on whatever, right? Well, you can accomplish that with like four blocks here. You just need somewhere to put the photos and something that will like automatically trim them to the right sizes and put them where you need to go. Um, you don't care, in this scenario, when you do design at this level, um, you don't care about where the processors are, you don't care about what the servers are, um, you don't care about what operating system they're running, you just care that they do the thing. Okay, so how do we tie this back to like the interests of our 6.3 friends? Like, fundamentally, we have, rem modern, com modern software engineering is so far abstracted from the like, computer that it's running on to the point where the computer itself is just a commodity, just like the, Amazon mo like the parts on the uh, Amazon PCBs from before. Like, you, the computers themselves, we don't care where they are, don't care what code they're necessarily running to, um, as long as they're on the network and we can like, ask them to do arbitrary things, that's all we care about. Um, and so this is how like, big applications are built at scale, because you can just go to Lambda and say, like, oh, 
how many requests do you want to be able to process per second, and just turn that knob up as you need to grow your um, as you need to grow your software. Anyway, um, I'm being a little high level and quick here because the um, exact methodology of how this works isn't terribly important. Just know that like in modern software development, um, we are super far abstracted from the actual hardware. So if we didn't even need a PCB before, we now don't even need a PC. Um, cool. So like the takeaway is that the circuit components themselves are commodities. We can get them super cheap and super fast. And also the computers themselves are commodities. We can, they are completely invisible to us and we're, they're completely invisible to us and so you don't care where they live or what's going on with them or how much power they consume or how loud they are or anything like that. Um, so all that to say, um, do we keep electrical engineers around just to keep the wheels turning, just to keep like knocking a percent or two off of power consumption or adding a little bit to performance maybe? Um, or maybe we just keep them around to make those little Amazon modules for us, right? Is that all we do? Uh, yes, exactly, that's, that's, that's all we do. Um, uh, I'm glad you've enjoyed the class and uh, we'll see you later. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Like, no, there's so much more to it than this, right? Like, yes, if you go look at Amazon and where commodities are traded, you will find commoditized hardware engineering. And you go, like, go look for the same thing in um, like enterprise software. The people who don't care about anything other than just making sure that like Twitter doesn't catch on fire, which seems to be hard nowadays. Um, if you go look for commodification, you'll find it, right? Like, at the end of the day, all the stuff runs on hardware, but um, the interesting bits of hardware are not found in AWS or Amazon Marketplace. Um, so the purpose of today is to tell you where the cool stuff is, why we care about it, and I'm gonna do that by like starting with some technologies and building up to some applications that people care about. Um, and then Addy's gonna take over the second half and then he'll, talk, he'll work the other way. He'll start with things that people care about and work down towards hardware. And somehow we'll make this beautiful, like, ethical hardware sandwich that is delicious and hopefully makes some sense. Does that sound okay? Cool. Um, sweet. So let's, let's start with some small problems to begin with, right? Climate change. Um, we've talked a lot in this class about, like, energy and power and how to... How to, fling, how to move that around in a way that like, produces useful things. I mean, we started out with a hydrogen-powered motorcycle, right? Um, and we've had a lot, of, and between um, Addy and I, we've had a lot of experience on electric vehicles, right? Um, and the current trend in the world appears to be uh, like scaling down manufacture of internal combustion cars and replacing with EVs. And the reason for this is because a quarter of the energy that the world uses goes into transportation. Um, cars aren't all of that. There's trains, there's boats, there's a bunch of other stuff, but um, cars are the ones that like, the consumers have the most amount of choice over. Um, so we see like EVs, and especially with like, bigger ones, um, this is the Tesla Semi, but like, we've seen Teslas for a long time now. We're starting to scale it up to larger and larger applications um, for larger and larger transports to have a bigger dent in the market. Um, we care a lot about like electro we care a lot about hardware here, right? Because like there's a ton of power electronics that's going on here in order to make something like this like cost effective and like actually work. Um, I haven't looked at the news for like Tesla semis recently, so I don't know if we know that they'll actually work. But if you buy the hype, like you know, we'll be we'll see those pretty soon. Um, so those so we're pushing. Hardware design is gonna be really critical to make this happen, right? Um, we also have a lot of like hydrogen-based energy systems too. Like we've seen um, the motorcycle that like Addy is putting together with um, electric vehicle team and also um, licensed to fab. But this is a slightly larger system. Um, it's put to, this is a like moderate scale, fully hydrogen powered um, electric boat. Um, I forget what the, bow length is, but um, this is a design that's being manufactured right now by the company that I worked for over the summer. Um, I worked for a Norwegian company called Kongsberg, um, and they basically make um, most of the world's like ship guidance and thrusters and um, a bunch of other like navigational radar and instrumentation that goes on like boats. Um, they're putting this together. 
and it runs on hydrogen. Um, this is gonna be a proof of concept for a lot of large, larger container ships because um, on a container ship, um, you don't want to be burning fuel oil, which is like the super, super low grade petroleum. The only reason we use it is because it's dirt cheap um, and it pollutes like basically everything. It's terrible, it's got a bunch of sulfur in it. Um, unburnt hydrocarbons, the works. Wanna replace that with hydrogen because it's a boat. We can um, have massive tanks of hydrogen on board and it's okay because the exhaust is water and we're swimming in water, it works out. These kinds of systems are really, really cool, um, at least in terms of like making renewables. Um, we also care a lot, like just within power electronics, um, at like power grids that are coming online. Um, as, sorry, it took America a really, really long time, um, many decades to fully electrify um, power came really quickly to big cities. Um, think like turn of the century, Chicago, World's Fair, um, New York, and um, Niagara Falls with like the um, Westinghouse power plant up there. Like big cities got power first, but in terms of like getting um, power all the way out into like rural Kansas, that took us many, many years. Um, and we're starting to see similar things with like developing nations. Like um, a big thing in the last like decade or so has been like India's power grid and how they're like starting to build that out. And again, it's a question of like what's that going to be powered off of? Um, are we going to burn coal because it's cheap over there, or are we going to have like more renewables come in? Like, um, and designing the grid with that in mind is something that matters a lot. Um, now that we have like really good power electronics, you can make sense to instead of like power your grid off of um, AC, like we did here in the States, because we built out our power grid really quickly um, when we didn't have good electronics, maybe you make it all DC and you just have like super efficient converters between everything because now the technology is good enough for that. Um, anyway, so hardware design matters a lot there um, and making sure that you build something that is both equitable and sustainable is really, really hard, um, especially when you have like a finite amount of money. So this is something that matters a lot. Um, and we also have like fusion coming online. And I don't mean to promise this as like a big pie in the sky thing, but um, there's a lot of good work being done at MIT um, over in the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, where they're basically making like the smallest possible um, tokamak reactor that will make net power. Um, it's called Spark. And um, again, if you believe the marketing, it'll be coming online pretty soon here. Um, but there's a little bit of, um, the, a lot of the like core technology underneath has been tested. Um, there's like one of the big like superconducting magnets that it occupies like an entire room. Um, that's what that thing is. And it sets some like uh, magnetic field world records. It's like 22 or 24 Tesla or something like that. Um, anyway, I'm biased, I think it's cool. I took a class with a guy that designed it. Um, and we worked through the math for it, and like, it seems, seems legit as far as I can tell. Um, again, my sources are a little biased. But anyway, um, trying to get this thing to work is like a massive power electronics problem. Um, a lot of, in order to like put energy in this thing to get the reactor starting, you have to like put in, um, you have to basically make a bunch of like really, really strong radars, and then r put them in a ring around the reactor in order to heat your plasma. Um, so you have to, instead of putting power in at like 120 volts, like you get out of the wall, um, at 60 hertz, you're now putting it in at like 50 megahertz through these tiny little ports in the side. So that's a really, really hard problem. A lot of my friends are working on that. Um, and that's just for getting power into the reactor. As far as getting it out, that's even harder. Um, so there's a lot of work that's going into that. Um, and also like computing itself, like is something that matters a lot for climate change. Um, we have 10% of the world's power is going towards like running computers in some capacity. Um, previously, that number was around 11%-ish because um, ether Ethereum mining used about 1% of the world's like total like energy. Um, and then they switched the algorithm that they use for, um, Ethereum relies on a concept called proof of work. They switched it to be more power efficient and then like the entire like world saw their like energy consumption drop like overnight. Um, which is kind of insane. <laughs> um, but like, as far as computing itself goes, like um, trying to make more efficient processors and more efficient like computing hardware actually matters a lot because you know, electric vehicle transports 25%, this is 10. These are reasonably sized proportions of like the world's um, energy demand. Um, and I think this is a concept like best illustrated by example. 
Namely, can anyone tell me what this is? No, it's not a motherboard. Huh? Yeah, this is the M1 chip family from, from Apple. Um, and like, again, take this, like, these are the M1 set of chips. Uh, these were released like around 2020 or so. Um, does anyone know what the defining feature of them is? Not that it was just made by Apple, but what makes them special? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, it's not RISC V, but it's ARM. Yes, you're right. Um, these processors use an architecture called ARM. Um, most computer processors historically have used something called x86. Um, x86 was a big, let's say, um, all a processor architecture means is like how it formats the instructions that it executes. Um, and x86 was made back in the 80s, and we've just been extending it a bunch since. Um, and this has led to some processors that are like large and powerful, but also really bloated and power, um, power hungry. So Apple had a bunch of experience making chips for iPhones and whatnot, um, and so they decided to make a desktop version and we got the M1 family of chips. Um, this is not hardware design in the sense that like you can buy a PCB with this on it on Amazon, um, but this is absolutely hardware design in terms of like computer architecture. Um, this has been some of the most exciting stuff that's come across the field in a very long time. Um, and I can confidently say that just because I'd spent a lot of time last semester um, like teaching the um, intro digital systems class here, where we'd spend a lot of time designing digital systems, writing out, um, writing the, or sorry, designing them in a language called Verilog. Um, and we talked to a lot of the people who had worked on these chips. These things are insane. Um, the reason why is because ARM just has like a far um, smaller power footprint than x86 does, which makes it so that I can like have my MacBook, this has an M2 in it. Um, I had to charge it like once this weekend. Um, and I was basically using it like all, all the time. Um, the power density, or sorry, the power footprint on these is like super low, especially for the power, or the, um, sorry, the performance you get out of them. Um, and so these are, you know, entering into laptops, phones, iPads, and whatnot right now. But they're also kind of going into server applications too. Um, the, there's like a bunch of Amazon data centers that are trying to re-gear their chips for ARM stuff. Um, and we're probably gonna see a pretty, like hopefully we see a dent in um, like power consumption uh, compute wise as a result. Um, because, you know, percent power that we save there, if we save a percent of power in um, like our chips, that'll go into, well, we'll directly see that in energy consumption like globally because it's all just been scaled up to like the data center scale. Um, the stuff is awesome. Um, if you're interested, definitely take 6111 or it's uh, 205 under the, the new numbering system. But computing itself matters a lot. Um, and let's say that silicon isn't your fancy. Um, or actually, never mind. Um, does anyone know what this is? It's a little esoteric. Uh, any guesses? Yes. It's an NVIDIA GPU, yes. This is the NVIDIA A100. Um, it, is, it matters a lot because, uh, or the reason why I decided to show it was because a lot of modern machine learning workloads are trained on GPUs. And as we saw from like chat GPT, people are gonna be paying a lot of attention to this in the near future. And even if we don't like make successful AIs as quickly as we want to, there's gonna be a lot of people trying to like train neural nets. Um, and so this chip, is, or sorry, this GPU is an NVIDIA product that was released, I think around like 2020 or so. And they use it in um, data centers, like in massive scale. Um, it goes into something like this, where they stack like eight or, yeah, they stack like eight of them into a single um, server like chassis. And, um, that's the CEO of NVIDIA, and apparently he keeps one of these in his kitchen. Like, there's also another like GPU over there right next to his like pepper grinder. Um, I guess that's what luxury looks like, right? As far as I know, those are the CPUs that run the GPUs. Um, so maybe. Um, but yeah, they stack a bunch of these into like these big racks, right? Um, and then you shove a bunch of these into a data center and now people can come train like their neural nets on these things. Um, this is like the industry standard for like training stuff right now. 
Um, these are graphics cards, they're GPUs, but like they've been geared for machine learning stuff. Um, they're not your like RTX like 4090 that you overpaid for or something like that. Um, they are, there's a little special in that regard. Um, but they're like basically the de facto standard in terms of like training models right now. Um, a big rack full of these is what ChatGPT was trained on for like a year or something like that. Um, I could be getting that confused with GPT-3. Um, but anyway, this is what like modern machine learning runs on. This is its bread and butter, right, in terms of like hardware stuff. Um, the problem is, again, that these consume a lot of energy and you can only guess how expensive these things are. Um, I, I was looking around and um, if you try and buy one of these like on its own aftermarket and you're not like a big server or uh, not, you're not a big data center company or something, they'll run in you about like 10K each. Um, so this is where modern machine learning like hardware lives. Um, but let's say you want to do something a little bit different. Does anyone know what this chip is? Or if you don't know what it is, can you tell me something that looks a little strange about it? What does this chip have going on with it that other ones you have seen might not? Yes. Huh? It's a photonic chip. How do you know that? Okay, yeah, exactly. It's got like this tube going in, right? This little like doodad here. Um, this chip is, does not have, well, it has silicon on the inside, but it's not used like normal silicon. This is a photonic chip uh, made by a company called Light Matter, which is, I believe, an MIT spinoff. Um, the interesting bit that LJ pointed out was that it has this little like tape going into it. That's a fiber optic cable. Um, the way that we use these computers is for, um, excuse me, we use light to do the computation here. We don't use like silicon transistors like you've seen in normal GPUs. It's all done with light. Um, as a, and it's a lot easier to like let light propagate and do its own thing than it is to like turn a transistor on and keep it running. Um, for this particular chip, I do not know how much it costs, but I do know how much um, performance it has. Um, it'll do 10 times what a single like A100 um, will do at one tenth the power. That is a 100x improvement in performance per watt. Um, that is two orders of magnitude difference that this thing makes in like um, in machine learning performance, like per, and fundamentally at the end of the day, you're paying for power, right? So like in terms of machine learning per dollar, like this is a hundred fold improvement. Um, this thing is kind of insane. Um, there, again, it's a startup, it has some marketing. Um, these are still being built out and put places. But if you believe the hype, again, this is something that um, looks really, really cool. Um, but like this is where hardware design lives. Like people have to design um, the silicon photonics that go inside, um, and that's mostly a space that's being dominated by EEs and physicists right now. Um, people have to design like the interfaces and the applications that like go on it. Um, there's a lot of like algorithms engineering that's happening for these two. So like there's a lot of people working on it. But again, we need hardware for this. We can't buy this on a circuit board on Amazon. Um, it just doesn't work like that. Cool. Um, or maybe you don't think photonic computing is such a bright idea. Eh. Um, and maybe you want something else. Um, does anyone know what this is? Yes. It's a quantum computer. Namely, this is IBM System or IBM Q System One. Um, IBM has been in like the supercomputer, like enterprise, um, like enterprise computing game since basically like it was invented. Um, and this is they're doing a lot of good work on. Um, like modern quantum computers. This is the last generation of um, platform that they built. They're currently working on system two. Um, all of the pictures that I looked for around for for system two are like CAD renders. So like as far as I know, like they're gonna keep that under wraps until they like fully announce it. Um, but this is what um, people have been like do, this is what people have been like cutting their teeth on like quantum uh, machine learning and like uh, algorithms engineering on for like the last little bit. Um, I actually, when I took 805, like the quantum physics two class, um, some of our PSETs were like making circuits that actually ran on these things. Um, it was a lot of fun. So we like verified the Bell inequality and a couple other things on them. But this is where systems like this aren't fully ready yet. Neither is photonic computing. But um, we, in a couple, I don't know how quickly it'll happen, but in a few years we're gonna start seeing like actual um, 
applications running on these. Oh wait, we actually ha already have. Like, um, there there have been some like semi-quantum simulations that have, that were run on a lot of the COVID um, like viral structure back during the like the heavy days of the pandemic, where people were just simulating how this thing moves, so that we could try and engineer like um, drugs to like go in there and beat it up. Um, New computing modalities are what's going to make this kind of thing happen in the future. As more pandemics come, um, and we try and like do more drug discovery for like cancer and other niche things, um, like we're going to need compute for it. And silicon, like, has carried us. Um, silicon's done a great job, and it's our bread and butter right now. But we're going to need more um, as we start running into bigger and bigger problems um, as humanity. So anyway, there's that. Um, it also, if you want to like take care of people and make sure that they don't get hurt in another way um, that isn't viruses. Oh. Okay, that's not going to work well. Um, I sorry, the adapter for my like laptop. Is very kind. Um, what? Sorry, that's not the right video. What is happening? Okay, well, I might just have to ask you to take my word on it because, again, apparently I don't know how to use modern technology. Um, maybe? Nope, that's not even the right video. Okay, great. Um, basically, like, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, like, we now have Atlas running around with like grippers on, um, helping people do their jobs. Uh, they got it to the point where like there's somebody up on this platform here um, who like left their tools downstairs and just pushed a button. Robot came, like built its own platform, grabbed the bag of tools, jumped up, f like flung him his tool bag, and then just like did a backflip off the end. Um, I know people at Boston Dynamics, and like this was not something that like they just like typed out in an afternoon. This took a long time to coordinate and put it together. Um, it's this is not a commodity yet, but. Um, trying to do co-design of hardware along with robotics and physics and dynamics is something that um, we care a lot about because like these, um, like Atlas is only gonna get more like elaborate and more capable and we're gonna start to see it like crop up in other places, at least that is my hope. Um, but like you need to maintain a, an understanding of what's happening in hardware and uh, in order to make something like this actually work. Um, the software engineers here, even if they're like working on like um, front end or whatever, occasionally they'll just have to like dive into motor controller code and like figure out what's going on. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with this as well. Um, so anyway, all this to say is that if you want to solve big existential problems, um, hardware is for you. Climate change is going to be with us for a while, um, and we like. I'd like to think that like as smart people, we have an obligation to do our part and like try and solve it. Um, and uh, even if you don't want to solve like problems as large as that, um, understanding hardware lets you write better software. If you know where your code's executing, you're going to be able to do a better job optimizing it. Um, there's a whole class on that, 6172. Um, cool. And also, when you do hardware design, you're like forced to understand first principles. Um, and again, that helps you design better things. Um, if you just buy like all of your, um, if you just buy all your circuit components on boards from Amazon and then just tape it together, um, you're probably not going to get the most well-engineered system, right? Um, so, so understanding what's going on there and doing it yourself builds that um, builds very strong intuition. And thankfully, debugging always has to happen. And so, make sure you have a very rigorous understanding of your system, um, and that you can't get away without knowing what's going on. Um, for better or for worse. And also, um, hard making hardware is like just really fun too. Um, this video is probably not gonna work either. But, That's yep, no, this is not gonna work, but yes. Um, basically, this, is, um, this was like the Model S Plaid. Um, and if you put it into ludicrous mode, people, like there's so much acceleration on it that like if you like hold your phone up to the seat and hit the gas, and then remove your hand, your phone will just stay on the seat. Because like, it's just going so fast. Um, and so like, these are fun to ride in and whatnot, but like, at the end of the day, hardware is just really fun. Um, you've got a lot going on with like, um, de debugging certainly like, makes it interesting, and there's um, 
There's a lot of nuance to it, but at the end of the day, we think it's really fun. You can solve a lot of cool problems with it. Um, so anyway, with that, I'm gonna pass off to Addy, and he's gonna like come at it from the other direction of like big societal goals and then like down into technology. Okay, is this working now? Yeah, it's working. Okay, um, so Fisher's goal for the first half of the lecture is kind of to tell you guys about like here are some a whole bunch of like super cool things in um, hardware design. Um, like uh, I think favorite example you put up is the Apple M1 chip. For those of you who don't know, um, the M1 chip is like a huge leap forward in what computing can do. It was fundamentally hardware design enabling even better computing systems. And I think one thing I would like to add to what Fisher said on men, um, is the M1 chip has both the processor and the graphical processing unit inside the same chip, and they both share the same memory. And this is a fundamental hardware design change, whereas normally like you have a processor, a GPU, memory for the GPU, memory for the processor, and anytime you want to get da data between anything, you have to copy stuff over. The reason the M1 chip is so fast is because it has a shared block of memory, and it doesn't have to continue to copy back and forth. And this fundamental change in hardware enables like huge advances in computing speed and also power. So, like, I mean, just an example, like what Fisher is showing you, cool technology. Um, what I kind of want to do is approach this from um, a different side. Like Fisher said, uh, who here is familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Hands up. Okay, we got a couple. Um, for those of you who don't know, you're about to know, and it's actually very important because in, for, for one, there's not a lot of things I can stand up here and tell you that this is like an absolute truth, um, but like, I think what I'm about to say that like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, make no mistake, are the biggest problems we face as a society today. Um, I think that statement is absolutely true. Like it's not advances in machine learning, it's not like, um, how like how do we get like the like financial issues that uh, America's face? It's all part of that, right? But it's all encompassed in like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are the United Nations like kind of has identified key areas that the world really needs help in. And when you look at them, they'll make a lot of sense to you. Like first one is no poverty. There's zero hunger. There's climate change. There's clean energy. Um, and kind of what I want to do um, is sort of give you a perspective I wish I had gotten when I first got into hardware design, which is like how does my work as a hardware engineer influence the greatest problems society is facing right now? Um, and make no mistake that hardware design is actually in many of these areas driving the changes towards like a better future for the planet, all the way from like no poverty to uh, like climate action. So here I've identified key areas where hardware design is making a fundamental impact. It is directly improving the UN's plan for a better future. Here are areas where I think it is, there is definitely impact, but it is less direct. Um, and here are areas where I think it's less of a direct translation, but Hardware design is always, you know, hardware design is everywhere. Anytime we do something in computing, hardware design matters for that, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm gonna go through, basically, over the next few minutes, a few examples of projects that I think I, I found, like, super inspirational, especially when I was starting out and looking at, like, how do you use hardware design to solve, like, the world's greatest challenges? Um, and, uh, yeah, and then I'll get into like avenues, later I'll get into a couple of stories and then like a couple of avenues that you guys can pursue even here at MIT if you're interested in using your work to make, to build a better planet for everybody. Because I think as engineers, like Fisher said, our responsibility, we have this, like we're here at MIT, right? We have this great access to resources and education and knowledge and like this is not an opportunity that many people have. And MIT has this initiative called the MIT Better World Initiative. We're all here to build a better future for ourselves, but also the rest of the world, right? And um, I think it's like Professor Grossman in 3091, for those of you who have had him, said it, I think, very well. It's like, we don't want you to walk through these halls like, oh, I'm so lucky to be here. Take what you have here and use it to make the world a better place. 
Um, so I'm just gonna identify some projects that I thought were uh, super. So we've talked about the like clean energy for a while. Um, we're not gonna talk about this one because we've touched on it a lot, but there's many parts of clean energy, right, that um, clean energy is a huge, a huge thing in hardware design. So one of the biggest problems in developing nations and like other nations around the world is like access to power. Um, so especially in like the rural regions and developing nations, access to power is like a huge deal. And even in our own cities, right, we have this structure right now where we have like a massive power plant somewhere else sending transmission lines across the country to get power to local stations and all this kind of stuff. So a new concept that has emerged recently is microgrids and micro storage. Um, microgrids is basically kind of an idea where you generate, like, you generate power in a very small area. It's a, sm a set, a larger number set of smaller power stations with local storage. Now, the technology to generate power locally doesn't really fundamentally change, right? The way we generate power is the way we generate power. Hydrogen is one of the um, examples we've talked a lot about in this class. Solar power is also an example. But then we get to the side of how do you store that power locally in a quantity that is like useful for, for, for what we're doing. So um, because you can't have massive power plants next to your home, you need to have a smaller power plant with large storage. So one example is supercapacitors. Um, and supercapacitors are this like alternative to lithium. Now, lithium is great, but lithium is also not great for certain reasons. Lithium batteries are like toxic to mine, and like they're like expensive and they're explosive, and there's all this kind of stuff around uh, that surrounds them. That doesn't mean they're bad. They're a good, um, good like alternative for what we have right now. But the future looks like if you're if the media is to be believed, uh, supercapacitors will start to take over what. Um, what lithium can't do. So supercapacitor is basically a large capacitor. And capacitors, um, like as we know, um, if I, for example, took a, took a voltage source and I put it on a capacitor without any resistance in between, I dump a whole bunch of charge into my capacitor. And maybe that's not ideal for how I want a battery, right? Like I need to control the current going into this capacitor. Or if I have a capacitor and I hook it up to a source, maybe I need some electronics to control the current going out of that capacitor, because like lithium batteries self-regulate a little bit, but capacitors don't. So there's a lot of power electronics design going into how do we use these capacitors, how do we make these capacitors, and like microgrid solutions like that. Um, one company to check out if you guys are interested in supercapacitors is um, Wright Energy Storage Systems out of New York. They're doing some interesting work. There's a lot of interesting work going on at MIT, even at our own D-Lab on using microgrids, supercapacitors, and things like that. Um, yeah, I said that. Uh, Fisher talked about Commonwealth fusion systems a little bit, but fusion is another one where uh, like, I think electronics and clean energy are really combining to like, develop the future of power. Um, I think clean energy is definitely one of the ones where it's like kind of obvious where the translation between electronics and making the world a better place is because energy is power electronics and yeah, someone needs to design a power converter. Um, but Zero Hunger is another interesting one. Um, so I don't know if any of you have heard of the company Ironox. Ironox is a very interesting company. I almost worked for them, I, I didn't, but because the pandemic hit. But um, Ironox is super interesting because for those of you who don't know, it's something, it's some ridiculous statistic that like 70% of the world's water use goes to agriculture. It's like some insane number of, like some insane amount of water. And of course, water is fundamental to agriculture. At that and also like the area of land agriculture takes up. Like it takes massive amounts of land area to get the amount of crops to sustain the human population, which is also increasing. We're about to hit like, what, 8 billion people on the planet or something like that, and we have to feed all these people. So part of the zero hunger initiatives in the UN is trying to figure out how do we make agriculture use less water and less land. So um, for those of you who are maybe, maybe less familiar or maybe familiar, um, there's a new technology, relatively new, called hydroponic farming, which is basically injecting nutrients straight into the plant locally using like electronics to control the concentration of the nutrients going into the plant. And you can do this in a vertical farming setup rather than having um, a large, large piece of land. So what Ironox is doing, which I think is pretty cool, is they have this large warehouse and they have um, 
like on this level, like they have levels of farming. Um, each level has like UV lights under it that are providing light to all of the all the little plants on it. And then there's like this pipe system that's going from plant to plant. And basically every single plant sits in a very tiny little container and the water that passes through goes directly to the roots of the plant and it directly injects the right amount of nutrients that the plant needs into the roots of the plant. So this avoids a couple things. Number one, fertilizer runoff. You don't get fertilizer running off into lakes and rivers and streams causing harmful algal blooms and things like that. Um, you also waste less fertilizer and you waste less water because it's targeted and then you can recycle the water. So all of this stuff is enabled by hardware design. How do you control the concentration of chemicals in, in, these, uh, in these tubes? How do you pump water efficiently? How do you use like minimal amount of power? This is all enabled by hardware design. Not to mention there's some robotics involved. They have a bunch of really cute robots that tend to the plants. Um, yeah. Uh, Mulchy spectral imaging is another interesting one. This is actually a huge advance in agriculture. It came out a few years ago. I don't, has anyone heard of multispectral imaging? So, okay, so this is kind of cool. Basically, they redesigned a camera to accept multiple different wavelengths of light. I don't exactly know what the wavelengths are. You can read a little bit more about it. It's like, it's a couple like DJI, AG Eagle, and Pix4D are all companies working on this kind of stuff. But they redesigned the sensor of a digital camera to accept different wavelengths of light. And when you take the readings of the different wavelengths of light, you can calculate just by pointing the camera down at the plant, you can calculate certain like types of plant health and things like that. So you can calculate um, the chance that a crop has a certain disease. You can calculate the chance that a crop will survive. You can calculate the area of your farm that is like healthy and not healthy, when you can predict when you should rotate crops and things like that. And like, it's a, it's, again, it's fun. Like, if they hadn't redesigned the camera, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, yeah. Uh, health and well-being is another, I think, slightly, it's a little bit harder to see sometimes unless you're talking about medical device design, which is also very critical. Um, GPS technology and stuff like that has also enabled, like, especially during the pandemic, everyone's heard of Zipline, right? Who hasn't heard of Zipline? Cool, all right, Zipline is, Zipline is a pretty, pretty famous, if you haven't heard of it, that's okay. It's, a pretty, it's just one of the more famous international development examples. Zipline is a drug delivery company. Well, they started out as a drug delivery company primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then they moved on to like, they're moving on to more logistics kind of stuff. They have an interesting business model where their logistics partnerships in the US and developed nations fund their operations in low-income nations. So it's kind of a cool business model there because they can reduce costs in the areas that need reduced costs by charging the areas that can afford higher costs. Um, one of the things they do is, uh, one of the biggest problems was in Sub-Saharan Africa, vaccine delivery is a huge challenge because you need to maintain a certain temperature of the vaccine. You also have to get it there quickly. Um, that and organ donation. Organ donation, as some of you may know, if you've watched, I don't know, Grey's Anatomy, um, you have like 30 minutes to get the organ to the other hospital or something like that. And on, uh, I personally have been to Africa. I worked with D-Lab in there for a little bit. For those of you who haven't, um, the road situation there is like terrible. The like going the distance of like a certain number of miles will take you like many times longer because the, like just the roads like you're sitting there digging your car out of the mud half of the time rather than like driving forward. So like for for drug delivery and for organ donation, flying was the clear like clear alternative. And they have these autonomous drones that they launch. They can get packages like anywhere in pretty much about like 30, 30 to 45 minutes. It's very quick. And um, all of this is enabled by advances in IMUs, advances in GPS. Because for um, those of you who are more familiar with like the drone space, uh, if you look at GPS and IMU technology and pre precision location of drones and things like that, how you localize drones, how you control them precisely, to know where a drone was on the map or have the drone understand where it was within some degree of accuracy, you, need to, you used to need to have three to four GPSs, three, four IMUs on the drone and averaging the signals from all these pieces of hardware 
even like, even like six, seven years ago. And now today, because GPS technology has gotten so good and IMUs, like because of advances in silicon engineering and stuff like that, have gotten really good, I only need one IMU to get a really precise position. Um, and that's all enabled by hardware design. Um, Moving Health is a company I worked for um, in Ghana. They're super awesome. You should check them out. Um, but basically, like once again, transportation is a massive issue in sub-Saharan um, like African countries. Uh, and like, so what Moving Health does is if you live in um, like a village in Africa, oftentimes medical facilities that you need to, like for childbirth and for like other like life-threatening conditions are very far from you in the number of hours, like, like it takes you three, four hours is where the nearest hospital is. And also the lack of transportation, you just don't have, like an ambulance cannot drive on those roads to get to the interior. It's just not physically possible. Um, so they designed these three-wheeled uh, off-road ambulances that help transport people from uh, like the rural regions to the urban population centers where there are a lot of um, hospitals and they can get better care and things like that. And it is really working. Um, they have a really interesting study that came out recently that you guys should totally read. It's on their website. But one of the super interesting things about this ambulance is it's actually IoT enabled. So you might be like, why is it IoT enabled, right? Um, but it turns out D-Lab's whole shtick, for those of you guys who are like, part of MIT, like who know about MIT D-Lab, Moving Health was a spin-off of MIT D-Lab, and like their, their whole thing is you need to interact with the consumers you are trying to help as deeply as possible to understand their true needs if you wanna help them. So one of the things Moving Health does is they track how many rides is their ambulance being used for based on the places they deploy it. How, what are they being used for? Are they being used to transport people? Are they, using, are they being used to be transport grain? Are they used to transport, like what are they being used for? What, does, what kind of weights of people are they looking at? How's the ride? And all this kind of, like there's an IMU in there that measures how bumpy the ride is and things like that. And basically they take this data and they're constantly using it to improve their product, even in, uh, regions like this where cell service is limited, they had to do a lot of clever hardware design and hardware engineering so that they could take data, ensure it was stored correctly, and every time your spotty cell phone service comes up, it's like, up, oh, let me upload all that data to the cloud so I don't lose it. So there's a lot of really interesting hardware design that happened here to make sure like, they could get the data they needed to improve their product, even in like, um, remote regions, and the, these, these principles translate to many, many um, uh, types of, they basically identified like, here are qualities we need to track to make sure our product is affecting people positively in the ways we think it is, and then they, use, they designed a hardware, a PCB that goes on this ambulance to track all those things. Um, I don't have a good link for this. Um, I'm pretty sure someone in the class is working on this. Um, I think they're a track two, but a new interesting thing is ingestible, flexible PCBs. So you eat the PCB and then it does something to you. I'm not entirely sure what. I think it's for drug delivery or for monitoring. You'd have to ask, I think it's Professor Gio Traverso's lab that's working on it. Um, hmm? Yeah, um, his lab is also working on it. But like, it's an interesting thing. I don't have a good link for this, but I'm sure somebody does. Um, but they are very interesting. Uh, flex PCBs. Um, and here's another, uh, this is another D-Lab project. This was one I worked on and brought up on the layout lecture. But this was a low cost UV disinfection box for hospitals in South Africa. During the pandemic, one of the issues was like, you know, doctors would come in, they have all their like tools and their phone and their stethoscope and all this kind of stuff. And it's all dirty from like, has germs on it from like contacting patients. And to minimize the spread of disease, they wanted a UV box, you know, like phone soap. You put your phone in it, you blast UV light on it, you take it out, it's disinfected, yay. But like even the $100 phone soap box is expensive for places like South Africa, you know, like 100 USD is a lot of money. So they were like, can you make a medical grade one for, um, for our hospital? I will come out with a disclaimer. The answer is no, we couldn't. It was too expensive, but we tried really hard. 
So like the fundamental problem was not could we get the cost of the PCB down? The fundamental problem was we used UVC LEDs, which are LEDs that emit UV light, and those are just ridiculously expensive. They're $35 an LED, couldn't get the price down. However, um, we did figure out later, and the solution we ended up recommending is if you make a PCB that can drive mercury, mercury bulbs can emit UV LEDs, and those are much cheaper. Uh, we didn't end up getting there because it was a semester-long project, but something if anybody wants to look into. Um, yes, Sustainable manufacturing, plastics. Has anyone heard of Precious Plastics? Great, pro these guys are awesome. Like, they're doing such cool work. Um, so, uh, plastics pollution, for those of you who like, are like, okay, that you empty your water bottle, you put in the recycling bin, you're like, oh, I'm such a great human, I'm recycling. Here's some news flash for you. 90% of plastic waste is actually not recycled. Um, and the reason for this is China with their, um, something sword policy a while ago actually stopped accepting US plastic trash because our plastic was too dirty for them to recycle. So now our plastic, and we don't have the facilities in the US to really recycle them properly, so our plastic ends up on beaches in Malaysia and Vietnam and, and other countries, not our beaches, so we are ruining other people's livelihood because we don't know how to deal with our trash. So. Precious Plastics has decided they're gonna do something about it. They're based in Eindhoven, the Netherlands? Something like, yeah, Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, and super cool project. What they do is they make plastic recycling machines that you can um, like do local recycling with. So they have a grinder, they have an extruder, they have a sheet press, they have all this kind of stuff that lets you work with plastics. And their idea um, and it's a concept we've been trying to bring to MIT for a while as well, is shred your plastic locally, grind it into like plastic that you can use, clean it, use it for injection molding. There's a lot of maker spaces here at MIT. You can make it in 3D printer filament. And this is, that's the kind of work this group does. Also enabled by hardware design. For you mechies, this is definitely more mechy than EE, but the power electronics in here matter a lot because how do you size a motor to, um, uh, how do you size a motor to like grind this plastic? Grinding plastic has a lot of, um, it like takes a lot of power. You were gonna say something. Well, the thing I was gonna say was that like, this is super, super cool, um, and that like all their hardware stuff is really accessible. Um, like I had a business that I ran in high school where we just like got a bunch of like old plastic and dirt dishes and we're just like working there. Um, they were super neat. Yeah, 100% of what they do is open source. It's really awesome. Um, so you should check them out. Um, more recycling, um, Apple. So for those of you who don't know, app, most of Apple's product these days are in the area of 90 to 95% recycled material, another reason I love this company. And the way they do this is, you know how they offer you that $600 for trade-in when you get a new iPhone or whatever, if you go to the Apple store? if you've ever tried to buy an Apple product recently, they always pay you for your old product, and the reason they're doing this is because what they're doing is they're taking it, using this robot named Daisy to take all of it apart, and then reuse it in their new product. So most of the stuff, like the casing is aluminum, they, reuse, they melt that down and reseat and see that stuff. All the gold and like the uh, cadmium and the other kind of like rare metals on the board gets reused so they don't have to remine it. Um, they, they, they're reusing like, I, the number is like 90% of what's in your Mac. There's some things you can't reuse, but like they're, they're trying to get it as close to 100% as possible. They also have a goal as a company to be carbon neutral by 2030. I think I read on their website. Somebody can fact check me on that, but this is how they're doing it. And they're enabling that using both, like this, to, to do this, you have to have really clever hardware design and you have to have robotics, right? So robotics is a whole side over here, but think about it like, you have to design a PCB to be recyclable, which is like a whole challenge on itself. Like what are the components on here I can recycle? How do I pick components so I can reuse them? How do I like extract metal after? It's a whole level of process engineering and hardware design that goes into being able to do something like this, which is super impressive. I have no idea how they do it, but um, yeah, they have a whole apple.com slash environment if you are interested. I'm just a walking advertisement today. Um, Okay, other uh, few, couple, couple more examples before I get into like the last bit of lecture. Um, deep breath. 
Um, life below water on, that should say on land, not on lab, and sustainable, uh, sustainable cities and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is work by the MIT City Science Group. These are called termites, which are basically little IoT devices that read things like, uh, like, like PPM level, like particulate pollution, carbon dioxide pollution, all this kind of stuff. You put them around in cities, and this is how they are tracking pollution levels in cities, both in the US and abroad. So I think they have, I, I don't actually know where the projects are right now, but it's on their website. And they use it for data logging and transmission. The other thing they use it for is when they design new buildings for like determining how good the circulation is or like how well it's like maintaining certain like environmental standards. They, they can use system like, systems like this, which use IoT to determine like how well they're doing. So data collection is a big thing these days. Um, and Rob Woods Lab, has anyone heard of the Harvard Weiss Institute and Rob Woods Lab? So this is actually some super cool work going on at Harvard at the Weiss Institute, which there's a very interesting paper that came out about this recently. But conservationists have been trying to understand how whales migrate to be able to like protect them better from like shipping lanes and all this, all this other kind of stuff, right, that we're throwing in the water. So the Weiss Institute developed this interesting little buoy that can record whale sounds and they're using like computing techniques to be able to decode these messages to try to understand what the whales are saying. But this requires like this requires computing but it also requires a lot of hardware design from the fact of like when you get that like audio in from the whale like you have to filter it and you have to make sure you're not getting I don't know a dolphin squeak or you're like whatever else like there's a lot of like how do you record acoustics underwater? There's like phase differences between how acoustic travels in water and acoustic travels in air and all this kind of stuff. So um, super cool work they're doing. The Harvard Weiss Institute honestly has done a lot of very interesting hardware design over the recent years. Um, they're very biologically inspired stuff. Check them out. There's a lot of also very cool MIT professors who did postdocs and PhDs and whatever in the Weiss Institute. They've come here to build super cool things. So definitely a cool group to check out. Um, yeah, so I also wanted to tell a brief story about my high school chem teacher and why she's my hero, because I feel like um, a lot of the time these days we go online and we see like, oh, Elon Musk is a hero, or like this person is a hero, or Jeff Bezos has so much money, and like all this kind of stuff, right? And like those are the people that get credit in the world. Um, but those aren't the people I feel who should get credit in the world. I feel like my true hero was my high school chem teacher. She very sadly passed away last year. Um, but she's been a huge inspiration to me personally. Um, and I think all teachers for me are huge inspirations because they take the time to try to get us to learn more about the world. Um, so my high school chem teacher, uh, great teacher. Like I learned a lot about chemistry while I was there. She'll probably be sad that I've forgotten most of it. Um, I'm glad I was able to pull out PV equals NRT for you first lecture. I think she'd be very proud of that. But um, what my high school chem teacher did teach me was how to learn. And I think that's a lesson most of us got at some point in our lives, but I got from her very early because like, she wanted to make sure we knew what was important in the world. Um, and my high school teacher taught me that, her name was Miss Anderson, um, and she taught me that it's more important to seek knowledge than it is to seek grades, something I think MIT tries to promote. High schools in America don't very much, right? Like everything's about GPA and this and that and like SAT scores. And like she taught me that you shouldn't care about numbers. Like you're not a number, you're a human being. And the point of school is so that you can learn what you need to learn so you can go on and make the world a better place. And this is the lesson she taught me. Um, and it's a message that I would like to pass on to you guys before we end the class. So some things I learned from her. Um, this is my brief, ethics for engineers. I think we also do a terrible job teaching that at this school, so I'm gonna try to do a little bit, a little bit here. Um, she taught me to do what you love and don't worry about how much you're getting paid to start. I think it's more important that the work is meaningful to you than it is how much money you make. Like, yeah, you can go for go, go work for Google and get like a six-figure salary right out of college, but if you don't care about what you're doing, there's no point, you know. Um, 
And that's like, I'm not saying do hardware design. If you don't love hardware design, don't do hardware design. But like, do, like make, sure, make sure it's something that is meaningful to you. Like pick a problem that really means something to you and try to solve it with everything you've learned in this class and at MIT. Um, work on things that align with your values. Um, many of my friends do things, and I'm not faulting anybody for it. Like I know we're all at earlier stages in our careers and things like that. But many people I know, and I have also at some point in my life, accepted a job or an internship from a company that's not super great. Like, you go work for Amazon. We all know Amazon's a terrible company, but I'm going to work there because it gets, gets me like stuff on my resume or stuff like that, right? Um, my charge to you is try your best not to do that. One of my favorite moments at MIT this past like, semester was when ExxonMobil was holding a recruiting event, and then a whole bunch of people showed up with protest signs rather than Signing, um, like signing job offers with Exxon because Exxon has been polluting the environment for decades and decades. One of my favorite posts was from MIT. And maybe I'm not supposed to be saying that as an instructor, but um, you're not. Like that was one of my favorite moments. You know, um, so work on things like if you if you're accepting a job offer from a company, I'm not saying don't take it. I'm saying take a minute to think about does this company have issues? Are there issues I really care about? Are they things that align with my values? Are they hurting my community? And if the answer is yes to any of those questions, I'm not saying don't take the job, but maybe consider what you can do about it, right? Because I also understand we're all early in our careers. Sometimes like you have one job offer on the table and you need a job, right? Like that's not, I'm not faulting anybody for working at Amazon, but just understand what you're getting yourself into if you work for a company like that. Um, uh, and share your work with the world. I feel like this is something we, we get caught up a lot in intellectual property and like patenting things and all this kind of stuff because we need to make money and blah, 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 and like who cares, honestly. Because like most of the stuff I have learned is from the open source community and a whole bunch of other like, like great projects that are like, here, let me just give you everything I did and you go figure it out. If you don't have a reason to not open source your project, um, maybe don't. Like, there's no reason to, to gatekeep knowledge, right? We're all here to like, like learn. We're all like, any anything you do, if you open source it, someone can pick up and use it to like make the world a better place. Even if it's like a half finished product, and you're like, hey, I don't have time for this. Someone else should go figure it out. Put it on the web. That's why. Um, like, at least that's why. I have a website with a whole bunch of terrible ideas on it. Fisher has a website. Um, there's a lot of people in Miters who have websites that we just put like here, like oh, everything I do is free, take it, I don't care, right? I mean, yeah, and then like, you know, or teach, you could teach. If you don't wanna teach, don't teach, but if you can teach, teach, because then more people get knowledge from you. Um, yes, uh, another, another brief point on the whole making money thing. Um, just because I feel like it was nice to hear it when somebody told me, so I guess I'll tell you, which is like, I mean, Fisher and I are grad students. We don't make a lot, but our work is meaningful, and like, I can still open source all my projects, and that's enough for me, right? So the excuse that like, I don't make that much money, I need to keep my intellectual property so I can start a company someday. Like, maybe if that's your plan, that's not a problem, but you don't have to do that. Like, don't. Don't listen to anybody who tells you you have to keep everything you make close to your chest so that like you can make so much money in the future. Like there are more important things in life, right? We're fine. On average, <laughs> there are people who are not fine. If you're not fine, then please, we'll we try to help those people as much as you can. You know, but like we don't. I make jack, so <laughs> like um, yes, just because we don't say it enough, be, be kind and compassionate to people and go out and make a positive difference in the world. Um, yes, other people to check out. Uh, MIT D-Lab honestly has taught me so much of what I know in terms of like applying technology to the real world and making a positive difference. Um, try to take a class with them if you can. I think everybody should take a D-Lab. Frankly, I think this is a better GIR than 6001, but that's just me. Um, uh, solar car and MIT Motorsports, I will throw up up here in MIT EVT, Edgerton Center, I'll throw these up here because they're like 
reasons, like many of the reasons that like I learned everything I know from about electrical engineering from these groups, Fish are the same for motorsports. Definitely check them out. Their um, teams are a lot of work. Um, also, Arcturus is another Edgerton team. They're over there. They're super cool, too. Um, sorry, I should have thrown your logo up there. But um, they're super cool. All, all of the Edgerton teams, like, really super cool teams. Check them out. They, they do a lot of really cool building stuff. Um, I'll leave this up. I think this is my, yeah. Um, I'll leave this up as you guys are walking out. This is just a list of um, classes both Fisher and I thought were really cool. Uh, I don't know if there's anything specific to point out here, but yes, uh, we'll put this on the website, yes. Thank you for a great class and join us Wednesday night for food and music and good vibes. Thank you.